Ecco, cominciamo. Buonasera, benvenuti. So, uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, welcome to the international area. This new space for the Rimini meeting, uh, which uh, stems from the collaboration of various uh, subjects. It's a sort of novelty for us. It's not easy to work together. And this meeting is uh, a, an occasion um, desired by uh, the DG, DEVCO, of the European Commission, the uh, AFSI direction, and the Italian cooperation, along with the uh, Cattolica University of Milan, ASVIS, and Concord Italia, to focus on uh, a set of issues uh, under the umbrella of uh, fighting against uh, uh, inequalities. The topic of today's uh, uh, meeting is uh, uh, culture. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Maria Laura Conte, and uh, I, um, I work for APSI, and I would like to introduce the guests, the panelists, the uh, general director uh, of international cooperation of the European Union, um, Mr. Stefano Manservisi. Thank you for being here. Then we have the uh, um, EU ambassador at the African Union, uh, Mr. Ranieri Sabatucci. Welcome. Uh, Charlene Barton, the executive director for Europe of an international organization called Search for Common Ground. Uh, she comes from Brussels for us. Thank you for being here. And Professor Will Farouk. Uh, he's a professor of uh, uh, Arabic language and literature at the University uh, Cattolica uh, del Sacro Cuore of Milan. It is not always uh, an immediate action to think about culture as a tool for cooperation. Even the more so in this period in which uh, Italian cooperation is uh, um, uh, raising uh, some debate uh, and uh, a sense of uh, a lack of direction, uh, especially when it comes to uh, problems related to the areas around the Mediterranean. We would like to understand how culture can become a tool for development, a concrete tool to favor, to foster development, which can no longer be conceived as a development there or here. It is a development which uh, um, has to do with us all, even um, in the, the even with the people of the Western world and the de developed countries. I would like to start from a provocation um, by Ferwin Sa uh, from Senegal. Uh, he wrote a, a book titled Afrotopia. And I would like to start from his idea of culture, because we need to move away from our uh, categories as Westerners. He says, and I quote, culture is uh, a tool, a search for purposes, a sense for the human adventure. This is why we need to carry out a radical criticism of what reduces humanity in cultures and it uh, keeps humanity blocked. Therefore, we need to uh, put a uh, new humanism at the center of our activities. So, Director, let's start from this provocation coming from a person, from a man from Senegal, who knows the Europeans very well. Um, what is the European Union doing? Uh, how does the European Union conceive uh, uh, commitment, engagement in culture? We tend to imagine that development passes through cash through money. How, uh, can, how does the uh, European Union invest in culture? I would like to remind you that the European Union is the largest donor in the world of funds for development, 75 billion euros last year. This is a figure of last year. Just to give you an idea, uh, in the US, they invest for development 20 billion euros. The EU and the member states, 75 billion euros. Um, what is the role of culture in this in this quota? Thank you very much uh, for the initiative and for the uh, question. To enter into uh, the topic, uh, the provocation on the new humanism is fundamental. Before even focusing on what we do as European Union, I'd like to um, focus on a couple of issues. Uh, we talk about globalization. We are all interconnected. We are all citizens of the world. We are all closer to each other. But actually, what is the reflection when it comes to the new humanism of this globalization? I wonder whether there is a reflection to be made. I wonder whether globalization and this interconnection, which is often very superficial, but it is also based on mm, lots of human elements, whether 
it can lead to common reflection, whether it can give a real contribution to a new humanism. The first thing I would like to say that uh, regardless these sectoral activities uh, uh, when it comes to development, we should wonder whether the culture as an aspect has either to been able to help us read the globalization phenomena. I've seen in many cases that there is a short-term kind of policy, which I call bad policy. It interprets, defends, or accuses, but a reflection telling us if we are really global, where is the global humanism? So the first thing I would like to mention is that we should never get tired of placing culture at the core of any action we carry out, because we are experiencing a transformation in social relations, personal relations at world level. And my personal impression is that culture fails to give a sense of perspective at times. So I would like to invite you all to reflect upon the role of culture. Globalization is political and economical, but where, where is a globalization which also takes into account reflections so as to uh, really have an opportunity for a new humanism? This is my first point, and I talk as European. The European Union is also a reflection on itself, on its basis, on its grounds, on its values. Why should we innovate? Why should we look for other roads, for other pathways? Why should we always focus on solidarity? We are reflecting on our own history, on our own experience. So culture as a way, as a method to read ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the new challenges and, if possible, finding um, a common grounds and responses. And I now come to the specific question. Why culture in the policy for development? Because the development policy of the Agenda uh, 2030 uh, of the uh, of targets for sustainable development is a reading of the globalization, a reading which requires an analysis on how to work all together in order to face problems such as climate change or uh, uh, structural inequalities, uh, structural poverty and our way to have a relation with the planet. And we need to make changes in this respect. We need to reflect all together. So culture as a method to read the things which have to be done and how they need to be done. Then the second aspect, um, how is it possible to translate all these reflections? So the first action is that of saying, well, culture is related to dialogue. Dialogue which enables the various cultures, religions, and communities so to carry out an intercultural dialogue. Dialogue is a method. Dialogue as a method to identify things to be done and with whom we should do these things. Then collective memory, the symbols, the symbols of living together. If you think about uh, the, um, what has been done by Daesh, well, the first thing they did, they destroyed Palmyra, they destroyed Mosul, they destroyed the symbols which represented a moment for cultural identity, and especially the identity of a community. So second action, investing in uh, identity symbols and tools. But there's a third um, pillar for, um, for culture, where culture creates uh, sustainable jobs. And we see this in all the actions we carry out when it comes to uh, performing arts, uh, sculpture, uh, cinema, uh, the fashion industry. So starting from individuals and communities, leading to uh, arts-related uh, performances uh, and artist artistic production. And we see this uh, rip, uh, accounting for 10 to 15 percent of the GDP in Burkina Faso, Mali, and in many countries of Asia as well. So we need to realize that if we invest in culture, we invest in activities which create new jobs and new job opportunities. So the EU has been investing uh, hundreds of millions of euros 
But what matters is dynamics, uh, how to um, create supply chains, uh, starting from subjects or objects. Uh, for instance, everyday objects in Burkina Faso, in remote places, transformed into quality objects, which can lead to the creation of small businesses and which can be messenger of the identity uh, all over the world. So culture as a way to read reality and to act on three levels, dialogues, the symbols of the arts and the living together, and the creation of businesses. How uh, is it possible to make this um, a long uh, term kind of activity? We work with uh, public policies, uh, uh, businesses of these countries, and these countries must be, and their authorities must be the first ones who realize that this is a sector which can lead to the increasing, the increasing creativity, and it can lead to future prospects and peaceful uh, future for these countries. So we, uh, we've organized uh, an initiative in Brussels in June with the creators of southern and uh, northern uh, countries of the world so that we could create and facilitate a cons the creation of a constituency, a permanent interlocutor made up of uh, creators and artists from southern world and the northern world. They should suggest policies to the policymakers. They should identify priorities. And they should um, work so as to um, work in a capillary way. In other terms, starting from the initial reflections I made, we want culture to become a permanent pillar of the cooperation policy in order to understand what, ha what has to be done and to work so that this can become a multiplier of inclusiveness and uh, creates uh, possibilities for the creation of new jobs. This is what we've been doing, and we hope and we, um, we would like to invest more on other sectors, and I will uh, dwell upon these topics later on. Thank you very much. Okay. So... Uh, one of the examples of this work, which uh, creates a networking of different activities, is Maisha. It is an experiment. It is a music-related proposal, uh, which the ambassador Sabatucci will explain to us later. And I would like to ask the technicians uh, to show a short trailer, a couple of minutes, which refers to a proposal which, through cinema, tells us more about uh, music. It's an example of cultural um, activity, which has to do with this kind of challenge. The integral uh, movie will be uh, broadcast on uh, next Friday um, at half past 9 uh, p.m. So I would like to invite you uh, to participate in, uh, in this event. <laughs>
Ecco, ambasciatore. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, can you tell us what is behind uh, this kind of experiment and the um, significance of this cultural proposal and its impact on the uh, local community? And how can you uh, introduce it in the um, engagement on the part of the European Union? Thank you very much. This is the first time I've seen this trailer. There were various versions of it. Uh, but, you know, it's always quite um, surprising to watch it. I would like to thank the Director General, who was uh, bold enough to um, give us trust for this uh, experiment. It was quite risky, and I will explain to you why. As a motivation uh, behind this experiment, well, there are two reasons. First of all, we wanted to introduce a human dimension and a cultural dimension uh, in our relations with the um, African Union, which are often limited to institutional kind of relations, meetings between leaders or um, high officials, uh, documents, uh, projects, uh, so red tape papers. We wanted to show that this relationship also has something different and more profound. It's a real cultural human relation. And the second reason is that, well, it was really an experiment. Maisha is an experiment. Maisha in Swahili means life. And we wanted to show that diversity should never be an obstacle to relations between people. But at times, diversity may even be a catalyst and a source of creativity, which also enables to create new cultural dimensions. To do this, it is not necessary to water or to eliminate or to give up one's own cultural origins. One's own cultural origin becomes fundamental to increase creativity. And the most important aspect is you need to be open-minded, of course. So you need to be ready to share your cultural background, your identity with others, and you need to be open enough to be able to listen to other people and to welcome other people's identities and cultures. These were the two objectives. Well, it was quite a risky experience, and I will explain to you why. It was quite a risky uh, experience because we had to sell a concert without knowing who would play at this concert. We didn't have any music, any score. But we've tried to sell a concert on the 9th of May, uh, the day devoted to the European Union. We sold 1,200 tickets, but we still didn't have one single uh, track. We didn't have any score. So to make life even more difficult, we said, OK, let's select six, six African musicians and six European musicians. Uh, they came. Um, to the country just two weeks before the concert, and they will create a concert. These musicians didn't know each other. And we've tried to complicate things even further. One might have chosen uh, six uh, African jazz musicians and six uh, uh, European jazz musicians. Instead, we decided to look for a specific musical identities, I would say traditional musical identities. So all the musicians played traditional music, but they only also used traditional instruments, and you saw some of them in the video. 
uh, the accordion for the European, but in Africa, there were other um, instruments, uh, traditional instruments, which are, t which are typical of specific countries. Uh, in Ethiopia, we'd ha we had uh, mazinko, uh, a sort of one-string uh, uh, cello. In uh, Western Africa, we have a kora, which is an extraordinary instrument. And the singer uh, coming from Zimbabwe um, played the ambira. So we chose, we picked the, the, the instruments through the social networks. Uh, We've inquired uh, with musicians, and we've asked them to send uh, so send us uh, short videos. We received 300 videos. We selected 12 of them, 12 talented musicians. They came to Addis Ababa on the 25th of April, and they were shut in a park museum for about two weeks. And they were required to create a concert, to compose a concert. They needed to prepare from scratch. They started to play uh, all together. It was an outstanding experience. Uh, witnessing uh, their way of working was really uh, extraordinary. I am not a musician uh, able to, to do what you will listen to in the concert, although I can play instruments. I, I thought they would start with standards, uh, uh, writing the scores. Somebody simply started to play. And this person uh, stared at another musician. And this other musician, the second musician, started to follow and to play. Every uh, two to three days, I went there uh, because I was uh, afraid of uh, that, that things <coughs> might go wrong. And uh, I was curious to, to see the way they were working. They, own, they also um, gave some lessons at the local music school. And all the activities uh, were um, um, there was a shooting of all these activities, and the documentary was produced. This is not part of a concert. Um, so I, my colleague Gianluca Bombarda has some examples, and we can offer you some some uh, some documents. Uh, uh, you have the documentary available in uh, in a USB stick, and we carry that the documentary in the real TV um, style because we wanted to make a documentary. So these activities uh, well then presented in uh, in the concert on the 9th of May, the Day of Europe, and the concert took place in a theater. At the National Theatre of Addis Ababa, which is still the largest theatre of Addis Ababa. Uh, it has 1,200 seats, but it's only uh, rarely used. It doesn't receive any financing for uh, the maintenance. Addis Ababa is uh, one of these uh, cities which are becoming more and more anonymous. It is uh, uh, spreading, it is growing uh, uh, thanks to the building of new skyscrapers by Chinese uh, uh, workers. But the risk is that of uh, um, ruining their traditional uh, heritage, uh, their historic heritage. The, um, the National Theatre was built during the Italian occupation, and then it was uh, uh, completed uh, uh, later. We spent some money to at least repair uh, one third of the seats uh, for, the, uh, for the audience uh, uh, had been totally destroyed. So we made some repairs. We uh, cleaned up the theatre. Uh, we have uh, um, renovated the stage in order to host uh, the concert. This was one of the most rewarding activities because the, peoples, the people from Ethiopia uh, kept writing, uh, thanking us for such an event. Uh, and they had never seen the theaters uh, such in a, uh, um, in a, magnificent, in a magnificent, magnificent shape. But the the morale is that if you share diversity, you can create something. Uh, you always hear people saying that Africa is far away from us. And we do the same in Europe. This is a topic. This is a, a way, a, an argument to say, OK, this will never work because we are too different. We wanted to pick the most difficult thing. And we wanted to show that diversity can create something which didn't exist beforehand, if you know, um, if you have some experience in music, uh, when you listen to the concert, you will find the DNA of all the musicians involved. And this is um, an unprecedented uh, kind of experiment. Thank you very much.
So, well, uh, this uh, story includes an element uh, which is typical of this kind of experience. One plus one is not two. It actually creates, generates new things that are contagious. So this is the basic idea, that is to say, this is uh, how we look at international cooperation and development. You start with projects that uh, bring about something new that in turn creates something more. So this is actually a way to start a process. So one of these processes is one of the goals of the organization uh, chaired by Shalene Barton, Search for a, rom a Common Ground. It uh, carries out uh, peace-building actions uh, through audiovisual tools. Charlene, please tell us how do you work? And if you want, you can uh, talk about uh, the uh, most important uh, criteria in your work so that we can take them home with us. Thank you. Sorry, I don't, I don't. Is this working? Are you, are you hearing me? Ah. Okay. So, but some people are speaking English as well. So you're hearing me. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Oh, and it's direct. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the work that we do uh, at Search for Common Ground, which is a peace-building organization. We're the leading peace-building organization in the world, and we're funded by different governments, included by the European Union, because it's indeed important to work towards peace. You cannot have development if you don't have peace first. I'm, at Search, we work in over 30 countries in the world, and basically everywhere in the Middle East, in Asia or in Africa, where there is a conflict and violence, there is an office of Search for Common Ground with staff who are there on the ground trying to build peace, trying to prevent conflict, uh, preventing genocides from happening uh, and atrocities. We do that building hope, building trust between communities that are divided and providing tools for people to manage conflict in a way that is non-violent. We believe that violence is, is a, that we believe conflict's normal, but violence is not something that is normal. We believe that you can have conflict, but manage this in a way that is not using the violence. So to do that, we use mediation, we use diplomacy, we do trainings, but we also use a lot of art and culture. And actually, since we started operations in the 1980s, culture is really one of the tools we've been using. Our very first project was TV and radio programs. So I want to talk to you about two reasons why we feel that TV and radio programs and culture in general is really powerful to uh, be a tool for peace. The first reason is that um, when you use the media, you can, you can humanize people you are not used to talking with, people you are not used to engaging with, people whom you feel are really different from you, and maybe whom you feel are your enemy. The second reason is that it helps you expand your imagination about what is possible, and it changes your perception about what you expect the world to be. And with the media, we can change expectations of people about how the world should look like and how behavior should be like when we're confronted to difference, when we're confronted to conflict. So I'd like us to show the short video, um, which is an example from a, radio, a TV program we designed for Nepal, uh, where it's a highly divided, politicized environment. There are a lot of uh, a conflict between political and ethnic groups, and it's also a, high, a highly patriarchal um, society where women have typically been excluded from decision making. So our, radio, our TV program tries to address this, and I'd like you to have a look at the trailer. नेपाली राजनीतिक इतिहासमा नेपाली जनताले पहिलो चोटी महिला प्रधानमन्त्री प्राप्त गर्दै छ अधिकांश शक्ति केन्द्रहरू पुरुषहरूले ओगटेको यो राजनीतिक परिदृश्यमा महिला प्रधानमन्त्री हुनुले निकै ठूलो तरङ्ग ल्याएको छ
हुन सकिदैन यो त खत्तम छ भन्ने सोचले हामी कहिले पनि अगाडि बढ्न सक्दैनौँ असम्भव नै भन्ने त केही पनि छैन नि बस हामीले सपना देख्न छोड्नु भएन हमें सरकार को इंजिन चलाने मत है कि परी आय को खंड में तेज को पार्ट पुर्जा पर बदल सकने आठ हाल में राखा कृषि प्रधान देश हो रहा हमी कृषिम निर्भर हो तर हमारा युवा कृषि बाटे पर गई रह भागी रह जो हम देश को लगी हम अति नई दुखद कुरा हो यो सरकार ने तेस को लगी एटा बलि फाउंडेशन अर्थात जग भैर करने जनता में आशा जाग रही आशा ने हमीर समृद्ध नेपाल को गंतव्य में अवश्य पूरा थैंक यू You still hearing me? Good. Um, so this is an example from uh, one of the TV programs we've produced in Nepal. I don't know how many of you have been able to read the subtitles in English, so I'll just summarize. Um, it's a fiction. It's a 13 series, uh, a 13 episode series that is fictional that we've produced with support from um, from governors to, to do this. And the purpose is really to show that it's possible to have a positive woman leadership in a role, in a, a context where it's typically uh, a male dominant leadership that's there, where women are excluded from politics. And it also shows the human face of politicians in a context where there is a lot of distrust against politicians in Nepal due to a lot of transitions. And this show tries to show the real face of people, of politicians, and how they're able to overcome the challenges of having to deal with people from different ethnic groups, from different political parties, and how they can include as much as possible people into the decision making. So I told you there are two reasons for using audiovisual, and the first one is about humanizing the other. And in a context of conflict, and we can see this even in Europe in politics, when there is a conflict between different political groups, you tend on sticking with the people who have the same perspective as yours. Um, people who relate to the same ideas as yours. And eventually you end up not being in touch with people who belong to other groups, people who have other ideas. And I think we can relate to this in Italy, we can relate to this in, in Europe. And the same goes uh, even worse in areas where there is conflict ongoing with violence. I want to talk to you about Nigeria. I'm, and the first time I went to Nigeria in a project we worked on, I, had, I was faced with uh, cities that were actually divided into two different areas. On the one side you have the Christians and on the other side you have the Muslims. Each group, each community have their schools, they have their, uh, their markets, they have their hospitals and they do not connect to one another. They live in the same city but they do not have any type of connection. And when you're in such a situation there is a vicious cycle because you do not talk, you do not engage with the other culture and the other community and it becomes easier and easier to dehumanize this group, to uh, consider them as not being human anymore, to believe that all the reason for all the problems in your life is because of that group. And that's when it becomes more easy for you to use violence. Uh, and in a context of active violence, it's really important to show the human face of other groups. And that's what our, our programs do, our radio, our TV programs, they show the human face 
of people from across dividing lines of a conflict. So in our fiction, what we do is we create stories where there are love stories, there are plots, there are um, a lot of, of things happening. Um, a bit like when you watch Friends on TV, the American uh, series, you follow the story of Rachel and Ross and you wonder what's going to happen. Well, we do the same, except we use people from different ethnicity, from different tribes, and we, we use these people to show that you can collaborate, you can have love stories, even though you're from totally different backgrounds. So that's what we use. And when, when you are able to humanize per people, even though they're fictional, then the next step is for you to actually engage with them in the real life. So that's what those programs are about, about providing a human face, showing that we all have the same love for our children, the same love for football, the same love for our country, and we use this to bring people together. The second example, uh, the second reason, sorry, for using audiovisual is because it gives you more imagination about what is possible. It opens up new possibilities. So for instance, in this show, Singa Durbar, uh, Miss Singh becomes prime minister. And in the Nepali context, this has never happened. Even in many of our European contexts, it has never happened to see a, a woman female prime minister. But when you see these radio programs, the TV programs, showing what seems to be impossible, it, can, it inspires people. It gives you new hopes of what could happen. Uh, and it inspires people to take action in the same way we're showing in there. So Nepali women showing, watching this TV program get inspired and say, okay, maybe I can be the president of my club at university. Maybe I can run for local uh, elections. And this provides the inspiration, uh, the motivation that people require to make a change in their, in their um, communities. So I want to stop there because of lack of time. I wish I had more time to give you more example of the work my colleagues are doing because they are really fascinating stories. But when you think about the power of these formats, the fiction formats that I'm talking about, um, in terms of how wide and deep they can reach people, in terms of their ability to bring people from across dividing line, uh, to, share peop to shape people's idea and expectation of themselves, expectation of the others, and expectations about the world. Um, I think you can all be excited about the world of possibility that opens up uh, using uh, audiovisual tools to contribute to safe and healthy societies in Europe, in Nepal, and across the world. I thank you. These two examples actually uh, brought us to the heart of uh, the whole matter, the use of uh, images and uh, stories. So I think that uh, there is a common element. Uh, are these uh, cultural uh, tools that um, shorten the divide uh, which is extremely important uh, for uh, development actions uh, because uh, we started to understand that uh, those who are different from us are not necessarily something uh, um, negative, on the contrary. So these uh, tools uh, show this. Um, the work done uh, by uh, Charlene and her organization goes in this direction. And this makes me uh, go back to what we were uh, saying before. We were talking about uh, the dynamic identities of this era of globalization. This does not mean that uh, this is an easy process, because uh, uh, when we want to uh, have a meeting of cultures and uh, different religions of different communities, well, this is not easy. This is not uh, without issues. So there is a big uh, effort that we have to make. So I ask uh, Professor Farouk, who's been committed for years uh, in this kind of uh, work, uh, promoting a real uh, meeting, because it is easy when you t to talk about dialogue, but the dialogue needs to be profound and real between people coming from different experiences. So Professor Farouk is Egyptian. I, it works. 
at the University Cattolica in Milan. And starting from this experience, he uh, created a series of relationships. And I'm asking him to talk about that, including all the challenges that are also connected with new technologies. Thank you. Good evening. And I would like to say that I agree with all of that uh, the director and my co-speakers said tonight, two centuries of uh, modernization left behind only what is linked with culture. If we look at the economic and political situation, we see disasters everywhere. But if we look at culture, the meeting of the West and the East, well, only culture really blossomed. Cinema, poetry, novels. We have a lot of uh, uh, noble uh, prize winners uh, to testify this. So culture is the real place uh, where people can meet. No development is possible if there is uh, not uh, a tool based on culture. So culture is precious, but it also entails a lot of risks and uh, challenges, specifically for this uh, cultural approach to dialogue. I will just uh, tell you a short story. I studied the fatwa, that is to say the, the religious uh, uh, sentence of uh, on everyday life, and I have found on a website that of Al Azhar, the biggest university of Islam. Uh, there is this uh, boy who bought the latest model of iPhone, and uh, like a good Muslim, the first thing he thought to do was to download the whole. Koran on his uh, cell phone. But since uh, the internet connection in uh, Egypt is uh, quite slow, it took hours before uh, the download was completed. So while time passed, this uh, boy had the need to go to the toilet. So. Uh, he said, uh, well, what shall I do? I need to go to the toilet, but I do not want to interrupt the download. But when he really couldn't take it anymore, uh, when uh, the download was completed, he ran to the bathroom, but then he stopped on the threshold. Why? Because he wondered, can I go into the bathroom with a cell phone with all the words of God on it? Wouldn't it be seen as uh, uh, something wrong to take the Koran to the bathroom with me? So this is the first challenge. The technology we use to take culture with us everywhere uh, is not neutral. I think that the West, in ma on many occasions, made many mistakes in confirming the neutrality of a technology. Technology is part of a culture, of a certain history, of a certain identity. The uh, most serious problem of uh, the cultural dialogue or the use of, cultural as, uh, the, of culture as a tool for dialogue is this, to hide one's identity because uh, in a world where uh, everyone is a protagonist and no one has a, a real identity. We cannot create anything new. We live in a world of globalization, a global made of uh, feeds on uh, social media. And we live uh, in a world of uh, post-industrialism, post-colonialism, and everything we know in terms of uh, psychology and philosophy is based on something post. Post means that we have lost the uh, skill to name things in the world. Two-thirds of uh, mankind believe that uh, men 
was created not by God, but when God asked man to name the things around him. So a culture without identity, a technology without identity cannot generate names or new knowledge. So this leads to another even more serious problem. In many cases, uh, we know uh, we talk about uh, the uh, clash uh, between stereotypes, uh, but uh, the worst part of it is, uh, even worse, is a dialogue between stereotypes. Uh, because when there is a clash, the clash shows that uh, there is a problem. Whereas dialogue is like a, 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 a disease that works uh, silently, but is very, very uh, destructive. Uh, Burkini, for instance, uh, created uh, a great chaos uh, in Italy and France. How many Muslim uh, women living in Europe can actually go on holiday at the seaside wearing a burkini? Less than 1%. I read a book that uh, talks about uh, what Muslim people really want. So well, uh, the dialogue between the stereotypes is even more dangerous. Uh, we invest a lot in burkinis, but no one is interested. Uh, this is a world of made of symbols. This is the third point of the third line in my reasoning. Public space. Uh, there are two different approaches, a, a French approach, so to speak, and that is to say in order to welcome everybody in with all their uh, diversity, you need to cut out identity. So a Muslim woman cannot uh, wear uh, uh, the uh, veil, uh, a Jewish person cannot uh, uh, wear the kippah, uh, because the public space needs to be uh, white, clean, so to speak, in order to be able to uh, welcome all identities. But a, a public space where there is no individual identity does not generate anything. This public space, in this case, does not contribute to any kind of culture in France. And uh, as many scholars uh, say, this is a parallel society where all the different elements of the society live in an isolated way in different parallel societies. Then there is the English approach. Everyone is welcome. All symbols are welcome. We can use all the symbols everywhere, anytime. But this uh, um, underlining the religious uh, experience Boiling it down to symbols alone uh, is not enough because uh, then the person, the human being, is excluded. So this cultural approach needs to start uh, from the ordinary man with the tools of beauty. And I can uh, read out the Quran to someone. And this person can say, well, I do not agree with what uh, it is written in this book. But if you look at a beautiful painting, if you listen to a beautiful music, you cannot say this is not true. I don't agree. Because the beauty has uh, an undeniable language. So how, this is how we can actually reach people by communicating an identity. We should not be ashamed of our culture. We should not impose our culture. We should not impose our identity. We should not renounce our identity. And I will uh, give you uh, a very short example. In 2010, we had the meeting in Cairo, but it was completely different there because of the culture of volunteers, for instance, was not is not so widespread as in Italy. So the here in Rimini, 
uh, apart from exhibitions and conferences, the most beautiful things are uh, the volunteers who work for free in order to create an ideal, uh, an idea that in a way corresponds to a certain identity. So I went to all uh, uh, social clubs of different universities uh, and I invited all the students to come and organize uh, their work as volunteers uh, to organize uh, a meeting in Cairo. When I arrived at the university, I found uh, Copts from the Orthodox Church in one corner rich American students in another, Muslims of uh, Al-Azhar University in another corner. They were all separated. So what did I do? I mean, if I'm going to preach about love, no one will uh, subscribe as a volunteer. So I asked them, who is interested in uh, information technology? A Muslim, a Christian, a rich boy and a poor boy, they all put their hands up. So I said, okay, you're going to be uh, the, the um, IT group of the meeting. Then I asked, who speaks French or another language? So on the basis of their interests, uh, we managed to put them together, not because of their religion or of their uh, ethnic group of their social class, but on the basis of what they do, of what they like. So if you want to reach someone, you need to understand what is or her interests are. And on the basis of these interests, we can overcome any kind of cultural or economic uh, diversity and generate a new form of identity. Because, for instance, in the Middle East, the biggest problem is that identity becomes a close shape that cannot generate something real, something that is capable of facing today's challenges, whereas European identity is empty. It has no meaning. So we have a close uh, shape and we have an empty space. Together they cannot create anything. So we need to understand people, to understand their interests, and we have to start from there. In Università Cattolica in Milan, we are uh, at the moment working on uh, a project based on clothing, the language of clothing. So the participating countries are France, Italy, and Egypt. And we are uh, studying the history of uh, clothing, the language of clothing that traveled through the Mediterranean, and the art of clothing. This brings together language, culture, history, art, and economy. So this is part of people's interests. So we didn't start from the veil of Muslim women. women. We started from something that is part of everyday life. So this is the challenge to create a meaning in our life. And I think that only culture can help us pursue this goal. Thank you. Ecco. Grazie, uh, professor. Thank you very much, Professor Farouk. We now have a, a little bit of time to um, uh, carry out a short uh, Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for our panelists, uh, now is the time to uh, ask your questions. Uh, we have a microphone available. Uh, just raise your hand if you have some uh, questions to ask. I would like to say in the meantime that the European Union has produced in uh, last June this manifesto, Culture for the Future, which is available here on the table. And you can also find it on some uh, folders uh, which are available on the tables. These are further tools for uh, an in-depth analysis of the topic which are offered uh, available for you. I would like to ask how populations and authorities of those countries have uh, received this kind of initiatives. Which initiatives in particular? Uh, which initiative are you referring to? 
uh, that of uh, that of uh, that of producing of uh, creating programs uh, uh, for for the population. So this use of the media to enrich and to create an exchange between the different ethnicities. Uh, I would like to know whether it was accepted um, both uh, by the authorities and by the population, by the local population. Uh, there's a space for a couple of uh, questions more, and then we will provide all the answers uh, uh, in, at one time. So that was the first question, so probably there will be other questions. So I will leave the floor to Shadi now. Question. So in the places we work in, we cannot work without the population and we cannot work without the government. Without the government because otherwise we would be, um, we would have to leave the country. And without the population because if we didn't involve the population, our stories wouldn't mean anything. So. How we work is that we have script writers who come from the communities. Everybody comes from the country and the communities where we work in. And even living in these communities, sometimes they don't know everything about a topic. If you're going to talk about the conflict related to mines, uh, or if you're going to talk about the conflict between two ethnic groups, maybe you first need to go and visit and spend some time in those communities. So they'll spend the time it take, it needs to be in these communities, understand everything, and then they will build this, the stories, the fiction. So it's fiction, but it's built on real life stories and the real concrete problems that people are facing. So usually our stories are really well received. In the Nepal example, one people out of four is actually following the TV program. In Sierra Leone, which is a country that I've been working in, we have an episode that has been a, a program that has been running for 18 years, two times a week, with fiction, and the drama keeps on going because people love it. So we have to get, and we get the inputs and the feedback from the viewers and from the listeners. We have hotlines, people can call in and say, oh, I don't really like how I d this character behaved. Can you change it in the next episode? And so that's how we adapt our stories to, to the context. And in terms of the government collaborating, um, we work with them as well. In the Congo, for instance, we work with the police reform uh, sector to create a, a TV program featuring a, a policeman and showing the good example of, of a policeman. In the Congo, police is highly corrupted and highly dysfunctional. And we worked with the police to create this TV program that would set an example of how a good cop should actually be behaving and collaborating with the police. I hope that answers your question. Prego. Um, well, just to make a reference, well, the question, uh, the question is uh, precise, as the answer was precise, but it's a matter of method. So this manifesto, which we facilitated, is the result of, a, of an interview lasted, which lasted two days. As a public institution, we've tried uh, not to say what had to be done or not. We just wanted to facilitate the creation of a permanent dialogue pool for, um, made up of intellectuals and artists coming from developing countries and European countries as well, so that this reality, based on identifying things to do, to do and as a consequence to put pressure on the governments, started from the things to be done. We, we didn't want to set objectives uh, and nothing else because uh, all the examples given, starting from Charlene's example, uh, the TV series uh, facilitating dialogue and peace building, uh, or Farouk, uh, when he says, we don't study the final phenomenon. We may give you another example, that of migration, just to, to remain topical. Let's, we, we start from what is behind, uh, and we start from the interests, uh, and then you can discover normalness, which can be found in uh, forms of combination in which public uh, powers, uh, um, it is not one of the methods of the EU. EU is there to facilitate, to foster the creation of a reality which brings cultural dimension as a key to read 
what has been done, the way it should be done, and what should not be done. And it should also provide sort of professionalism. So focusing on the entrepreneurial aspect, the quality of job, the quality of work, the access to financing, access to markets, because we want to show that development is not simply something which has to do with charitable activities. You simply transfer funds to solve a problem. It is a cultural process in which we are all involved. So that was the idea uh, for this manifesto and the chapters of the manifesto, because we wanted to follow the, well, the example of Maisha and Ambassador Sabatucci. That's a living example of what I'm saying. So started from nothing and and leave the floor to the musicians. Are you willing to create um, a show? Are you willing to create a concert? Uh, do you want to say something with your music? Well, the musicians found the product, and they found a way to talk about education, culture, music, arts, uh, at peace, and being together, and playing together. Of course, the governments are very important, but the same applies to Italy and the same applies to developing countries. If you don't have the communities involved, if you don't have common people um, pushing to obtain things, you cannot impose anything and it wouldn't be useful to impose anything on the population. Uh, when Professor Farouk was talking, uh, um, an, an anecdote came to my mind which refers to Maisha. I've always found, found it fascinating. Uh, whether culture is neutral or not. Um, Maisha has become uh, a documentary. We have the director, and I would like to thank him for the work. As all documentaries uh, uh, produced on the basis of real TV, we expected and we hoped, uh, we expected that moments of tension, and there, were, there was a moment of tension. One day was lost out of 15 days because there was a moment of tension between the musicians. Everybody can imagine. You take 12 people who have never met each other, coming from 12 different countries from Africa and Europe. Of course, there may be misunderstandings. The first misunderstanding may be between Europeans and Africans. But actually, the real misunderstanding and the real moment of tension was uh, when it comes to the use of the language. Because half of them spoke French, the other half of them spoke English. And so, at turns, they uh, felt marginalized because the French language or the English language was being used. So there was a moment of tension due to the use of language. Nobody was uh, of English or French mother tongue. Yes, we had two French musicians, but with the exception of two or three people, nobody was a uh, French or English mother tongue. So the language was only a vehicle. And in the documentary, at a certain point, you, you will see it. When you play music, you have no problems it could be because music and the, and the notes are the same for everybody. And so the tension ended as soon as they started to, to play. So it was a tension based on the use of uh, French or English as a, as a common language. The tensions were not at all due to their origins or to their ethnicity. And I, I found this fascinating. Is there enough time for me? I would like to tell you just a small thing. At the end of the Cairo meeting, we invited Joseph Weiler, um, a Jewish and is very uh, renowned here at the meeting. We forgot that on Shabbat, on Saturday, they cannot carry out any activity involving technology. So he had to climb the Muhaktam mountain, walking for two hours, where the castle of the Saladin is located, for the meeting, because it could not take any transport, any IT, any technological transport. It was a shock for the Catholics and the Christians and the Orthodox, because we forgot this cultural-related aspect. But he's a very good person. He didn't create any problems. Well, he walked for two hours in order to stick to the agenda we proposed. After the meeting uh, with Mr. Weir, he couldn't take the car to get back to the hotel and to, to his home. He had to, uh, to um, go down from the mountain to uh, the city by walking. What happened in the community? All the Christians and the Muslim present there decided to walk with him. 
So it was not left alone. This is what makes culture. Culture makes you uh, overcome all the barriers. Thank you. Are there any other questions? There are another couple of questions. Please uh, ask them together. Good evening. I would like to have um, an aid from you. I would like to know why uh, the EU invests so much money directly in development. Why does the European Union use community resources for international development? I'm referring to direct funding. I would like to receive an help in understanding. I am Italian, I'm a European, so if I am arid, I could say I am not interested in Nepal's development, so I have some ideas, but I would like to receive some hints from you. Uh, good evening. My name is Alexander. I come from Indonesia. And I would like to tell you a little bit about my situation. I know that this discussion is quite complicated. I know the topic. My wife is from Bologna. I'm Indonesian. I live, I live in a country uh, which has 260 million people. 99% of them are Muslims. I'm Catholic. So uh, less than 1% of Indonesian people uh, are of Catholic uh, religion. I need to say that during my childhood, everything was fine, but now everything has changed. My question is the following. We, are, uh, we have a high-level education here, but when it comes to grassroots, to people who are not um, trained or educated, well, the situation may become much more serious because ISIS uh, um, has an impact on education as well. I've also worked in, for three years at the European Commission when Mr. Romano Prodi was a president. I know the difficulties of the European Union to, to be together. But I think that this is an initiative which uh, will bear fruits in the long term, but I, I hope you will maintain it. You, I hope you will keep working this way because this is the only way to go. Thank you. There's a third question. Thank you. I would like to have received some clarifications on the fact of using uh, uh, culture as uh, a tool for creating businesses. How can you concretely use culture to create professionalism among people? We've talked about cinema, fashion, music, but concretely, how can you use culture to create a profession? So I would like to start from you, Director. Uh, well, clearly, why, well, the, 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 as for the first question, uh, well, we would need a very long discussion. The first one is, the first reason is uh, political and bureaucratic. We have uh, signed international obligations, the member states and the European Union, and these uh, obligations envisage for solidarity at international level for eradicating poverty, combating exclusion, and making world the world a better place to live in, where differences do not become so important um, as to create um, splits and uh, clashes and wars. So we have an international agenda in which the EU is engaged with resources, uh, investing up to 0.7% of the GDP to contribute to this um, work, which is considered a global work to make the world um, a better place with, uh, um, with less poverty. Maybe you're not interested in Nepal, in Nepal but maybe you would be more interested when um, we have to do something because we receive illegal immigrants coming from Mali because uh, uh, of the economic situation or the political situation in Mali. And the best response we can give is uh, let's send them back to Mali. The EU has signed 
obligations because it strongly believes in sharing this, this international agenda. And there's, there's a second aspect, which is less bureaucratic. We, as European Union, um, have established the European Union uh, on the basis of inclusiveness, solidarity, and the European Union was created after the Second World War. Europe came out of this uh, tremendous period. Um, it came out of the Second World War tragedy because uh, we focused on solidarity. So it is in the DNA of the European Union um, that of stating, let's try and share. I'm not referring to imposing. We should share. Of course, we don't have a linear success story, but there's a trend towards solidarity as a way to carry out foreign policy as well. So why do we do it? Well, we do it because of these reasons. Culture is just one of the components. It is not the, the biggest or the most important component, but the effort of the European Union is based on international commitments, even the more so, because if you focus on a, an unsustainable development agenda, think about the climate change or the unsustainable inequalities which lead to um, radical behaviors. We think that if we cooperate together, if we work together in different ways, we will have more possibilities to, um, to survive all together uh, and to overcome the challenges and to, um, to be successful. And we tend to do this because the European Union uh, has this kind of cooperation in its DNA. We have never been a military superpower. And we, um, for this reason, we focus uh, on building more prosperity for all. It's a development policy for us all. Uh, the European Union, uh, relief from poverty, uh, hundreds of millions of Europeans. Uh, so it's a superficial answer, but we should share our well, uh, well-being. As for culture, uh, we, we don't want to use culture for. We read what culture is doing. Uh, when you think about um, countries such as uh, uh, very poor countries such as Mali or Burkina Faso, 10-15% uh, of the GDP uh, results from the um, textile industry, the cinema industry, the theater industries. But these industries are non-professional. So we should discuss with these uh, countries and we should discuss with intellectuals, with the, create, with the creators. And we uh, realize that we need infrastructure, we need um, training policies, we should also facilitate access to credit to create businesses. Today, a young man having an idea for a, a, um, a theater show or for a film, if he goes to a bank in Ouagadougou, he will never receive financing. But in the same country, 5% of the GDP is created uh, by uh, artistic productions. So we try and facilitate access to credit thanks to the creation of small and medium-sized enterprises. And because we know that if you facilitate access to credit, you can create sustainable uh, job creation and you facilitate inclusiveness. We do not impose culture. We simply read what the situation is like and we offer a support so that from this extraordinary trend to create, you can not only create good products, but you can also build an industry which can continue um, creating products and uh, gaining access to our own market as well. Thank you. And, uh, Alexander, I want to say that we just finished a project funded by the European Union in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we were supported to work with youth and with young political leaders and activists to support them and build their capacities in, um, in, in being young actors um, who have a positive change in their communities. And a lot of the work we do is also on interreligious dialogue. This is really important um, to, to protect the minorities and to give them the capacity to be protected and to be um, worshipping the religion that they believe in, in all peace. I want to go to your um, question about, I mean, building on what uh, 
my colleague has said, um, it's indeed there is this idealist view of Europe and Europe not being a superpower, but wanting to use its idealism to set an example in the world. Um, if you let, um, if you let autocratic government run forever, uh, if you do not exert any pressure, uh, and if you do not support um, the rise of a democratic movement in some of the countries, then you will end up having to face the consequences as well in Europe. So maybe Nepal doesn't seem so obvious in terms of the relationship between Nepal and Europe, but I think it becomes much more obvious when we think about, about the Sahel or about Syria and the direct consequences that we're facing in Europe and in Italy. Um, so we're in a world that is more and more interconnected and we cannot work anymore as if we do not relate to one another, as if we're connected to one another and as if the consequences of what's happening on the other side of the world uh, actually can impact us and our stability in Europe. So promoting world peace, promoting global stability actually contributes to our stability in Europe and in Italy. So that's uh, already a very good reason for promoting development uh, across the globe. For the first question, I think that uh, to we have to understand what is the economic benefit for Europe. El Cairo is the second city after London to have a railway that was not because Egyptians want El Cairo to be modern, but because after the civil war in the United States, the cotton could not be brought to the uh, industries in England, so uh, that's why they built a railway. So I think that this uh, development is not a gift, so to speak. It is an investment in a global and world economy. And if this investment uh, uses the tool of culture, we can actually see these uh, aspects of radicalization today at the meeting at 3 o'clock, a great figure of the Islam world, His Excellency El Alahiza, admitted that in the past uh, Something was done to bring extremism also in the schools, but to be aware of these mistakes is a good starting point for a change in the future. Thank you. Well, our allotted time is now over. I would like to thank my panelists. I have a couple of information, of pieces of information to give you. The meeting in Rimin, in Rimini, is possible, and well, we are here. We did, you didn't have to pay a ticket, and this is uh, all owing to uh, the uh, organization of the meeting. So please donate. A euro is already a contribution, so please donate in the dedicated desks. So to the volunteers wearing a red T-shirt. Then uh, there is this uh, manifesto. You can take it with you because it is extremely interesting. And then we will uh, close with some beautiful music. The Maisha music. We could even dance. Why not? Thank you. And uh, we will uh, wait for you at the arena at 12.30.